chief priests who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on all them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. May God's richest blessing be to his word, may it be sanctified in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for it's the interest of your word that gives light. And it's our hope, our expectation, Lord, our great desire that you'd open your word to us, that we might see Jesus in all of his majesty, his splendor, and his glory. And that your word might speak to us. It might feed us, it might comfort and encourage us, it might lift our spirits, it might challenge us, Lord, and admonish us to follow even more diligently after Jesus. So speak in Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And it's a joy to see some of you out this morning. I want to encourage you to bring someone with you next week. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning from a simple subject of God's power at Ephesus. God's power at Ephesus. As I've shared with you before, I think that one of the real challenges that faces the 20th century, 21st century church is that the 21st century church has to rediscover her identity as to what it means to really be the church. We live in a day and age of great spectator sports, and so we're used to going, watching other people exercise and perspire and engage in athletic endeavors, and we go and watch and we think that we've done something. And so we go to movie theaters and we sit and we watch people on the big screen and we feel good about going and we think that we've done something. So this mindset of being a spectator of watching someone else do something has infiltrated the church. And so we come to church and we watch and listen to the choir sing and we watch the ushers usher and we watch the praise leaders praise and we listen to the preachers and the deacons pray and we listen to the preacher preach and we think we've done something. But we've been more of a spectator than we have an actual participant. And so it manifests itself in a growing indifference toward the things of God. We feel like we have really done something when we've only, only observed and been a spectator. So as we look at the Bible closely, we find that what is God's intent is that we will find each other, that we will find each other in the church. And I believe that God brings people together. I really believe that God brings people together and that God creates local New Testament churches. And that we're not even aware of the fact that we're being led by the Holy Spirit through the invitation of a friend or family member, through an unction on the inside of us that we should go and unite with a certain local congregation. But I believe that's the Holy Spirit, God bringing us together so that we can find each other. We find each other in this waste, howling wilderness we call the world, and we connect and we find each other at the church. And I believe that's what this text teaches that we're going to examine this morning. However, here at the Grace Bible Church, if I were to ask you this morning to identify seven people here that you don't live with, some of you will be hard-pressed to do that. We come here week to week, we pass each other in the parking lot, we pass each other out there in the, in the vestibule area, we come into the worship place and we sit next to people and we don't even know their names. Because it takes effort to move beyond just casual encounters and so what the church is becoming, it is almost, it's not much different from a basketball game or a football game. That we go together and we feel like we're all fans together, but we don't even know each other. And we go and we cheer and we have this experience together and then we leave and we go away and we really haven't connected in any real depth and in terms of meaningful 
relationships. I really want to encourage you guys to stretch yourself just a bit. And we start a little fellowship here with the 18 to 40s, the uh, young adult ministry. And I want to encourage you young people to, I know you're very busy, you've got a lot of places to go and a lot of things to do, but to, to connect with this group of young people because y'all need to find each other. Y'all need to find each other around the Word of God, find each other around prayer, and in so doing, I believe that God will help you find friends that you've been looking for. Friends that are trying to serve God, friends who want their life to count for the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll find people of, of a kindred spirit. Can I get a witness this morning? We saw last week how God encourages us, and God very often encourages us through other people. Through other people that we get to know, we, we come to love and to trust and to respect in the context of the local church because we learn about their struggles but their desire to still to serve God. And so Paul was comforted through the confidants who had a kindred spirit. God brought him in contact with a man by the name of Aquila and his wife Priscilla. And Paul met them at Corinth in a very low time in his life. But God supernaturally had brought them from Rome because they had been expelled by Claudius, the Roman emperor. For some reason, they felt led to go to Corinth. There they connect with the apostle Paul, and they have the opportunity to be taught the word of God and to be discipled into fellowship with one of God's sure servants of the day. And then we see how God continues to encourage Paul through the conversions of key leaders like Justice and Crispus there at the synagogue at Corinth. And then God comforts Paul in, first, uh, in Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11, through, through comforting words at midnight. And then he confirms the apostle Paul by giving him deliverance from being arrested in the courtroom. Now, what I want you to see this morning, you've got to look at the Bible closely to see these little nuances. There are nuances in the Bible that you really don't see unless you look at it very, very closely. So Paul had been at Corinth. He spent about 18 months at Corinth. Corinth was a large city, metropolitan city, deeply entrenched in idolatry and paganism. So Paul wanted to make sure that the church was strong in the word of God before he left. So after 18 months of teaching, he decides it's time for him to move on. So he moves on with Aquila and Priscilla, and they come to Ephesus. Now he's on his way back to Jerusalem and then to Antioch, but he comes to Ephesus, and Ephesus is in Asia Minor. It's a seaport city. It's also a very large metropolitan city, and it's also a city that is deeply entrenched in pagan idolatry. The goddess Diana, or it's also referred to as Artemis in the Greek, this was a huge shrine where the people came to worship this goddess of sexual morality and fertility. And they were so immoral that sexual morality was a part of their worship experience. They thought they got closer to God by engaging in sexually deviant acts. There was black magic. There was the occult. There was witchcraft. There was idolatry. There was demonic worship at Ephesus. But Paul understood that if he was going to have an impact in the name of Christ in Asia Minor, that Ephesus was a city that had to be dealt with. Now, when you understand this, you Bible scholars, you come to the book of Ephesians, you find that Ephesians is the most complicated, it's the most theologically deep book in the entire New Testament. Because Paul spent three years at Ephesus, and he spent three years discipling a group of elders and Bible teachers there because he knew the only way they would be able to withstand the wildering attack of the evil society on the outside, which the church was strong in the word of God. So now this is Paul's first real stint at Ephesus. He brings Aquila and Priscilla with him to Ephesus. Now if you back up in Acts chapter 18, verse 19, he says, and he came to Ephesus, he left them there, meaning Priscilla and Aquila, he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, and when they had asked him to stay longer time with them, he did not consent but took leave of them, saying, I must by, by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the regions of Galatia, Phrygia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now, I don't have time to get into all of this, but you get a map. 
And you'll see that Paul was aggressively on the move. He leaves Corinth. He comes to Ephesus. He spends a couple of weeks or maybe a month there. He leaves Ephesus. He heads toward Jerusalem because he wants to keep one of the Jerusalem feasts to be in Jerusalem when all the people come for the great feast. So he will have one, maybe last opportunity to try to have a strong witness to Jews that are scattered around the world. He comes to Jerusalem. He goes to Damascus. He goes back to Antioch in the north. And then after spending a few days there, he heads out on a third missionary journey across the belly of Asia in the Galatian province. He's on the move. But watch what God does while Paul is on the move. He is retracing his first missionary journey across the middle of Asia. He has left Aquila and Priscilla at Ephesus, and it's on the southern middle part of Asia, what's called Asia Minor. And he plans on coming back to Ephesus on his return visit back to Antioch. But watch what God's, God does. Verse 24, unbeknown the Apostle Paul. So after Paul... He's been to Ephesus. He's reasoned with the Jews. He promises he's going to return. He heads back to Jerusalem, then Antioch, and now he departs on his third missionary journey across the middle of Asia. Verse 24. We're introduced to a man by the name of Apollos. And Apollos arrives in Ephesus. There's nothing in the Bible that suggests that Paul knew Apollos. As a matter of fact, I think you're going to see that he did not know him. They had had no contact with each other prior to this, what we're going to see in this text. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scripture, came to Ephesus. Now here's the nuance I want you to see. The nuance I want you to see that without Paul even knowing about it, God is bringing a person that is equipped, and that is trained, and that has the conviction to help build on the work that Paul has already started, a man by the name of Apollos. He's identified as a Jew who was born in Alexandria. That's important. Apollos was a Jew, but he was born outside of Israel. He was born in Alexandria, which was in Macedonia. And Macedonia is not that far from Corinth and from Athens. So Apollos, being a Jew, born in Macedonia, spoke the Greek language, familiar with the Greek culture, familiar with all of this urban, cosmopolitan city lifestyle, God, by his own supernatural hand, brings Apollos to Ephesus. God is stitching things together. He's stitching together help and support to advance the work that the Apostle Paul has established. Now look at Apollos. He's described as being a Jew, born in Alexandria, eloquent, a skilled orator, maybe even a mighty debater, a man mighty in the scripture. He came to Ephesus. It goes on to say, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now stop right there. Apollos was skilled, he was eloquent, he was mighty in the scripture. He was accurate, but his understanding was incomplete. He had an accurate understanding of what he knew, what he had been exposed to. So Apollos had been exposed to the teaching of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's ministry was a ministry that was to prepare the way for the Messiah. So John preached and John baptized, and he says, I baptize you unto repentance. There's coming one after me who is mightier than I am. He's the one that's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But Apollos had not heard about the ministry of Jesus. Apollos had not heard about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and apparently Apollos had not even heard that the Holy Spirit had come. He was accurate in what he was teaching, but his teaching was incomplete. That's why you got to sit down and you got to learn something, y'all. I'm just going to be honest with you. You got to sit down and you got to learn and you got to sit down under good Bible teaches so what you know can not only be accurate, but so it can be complete. 
The mission of the church is trying to equip people in the word of God so you are so skilled in the scripture so that when you go back out in the marketplace and you go back to your work or back to your neighborhood or your community, as people are talking in real time about real life, you are able to take the word of God and show the relevance of the word of God to real time, real life situations. That's why I encourage you, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice at 1040 on Sunday morning to be in discipleship class. That you might learn the word of God. That you might be a workman who starts to show himself or herself approved. A workman who does not have to be ashamed, but who can rightly and decisively and clearly and accurately divide the word of truth. So Apollos had a whole lot of zeal, but he didn't have full understanding. He didn't have full revelation, so Apollos could not bring people to full salvation. But what he got, he's working with it. And so what does he do? He comes to Ephesus, and his ministry is patterned after that possibly of Stephen. He heads straight to the synagogue, and he starts to debate with the Jews in the synagogue, verse 26. And so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. As eloquent as he was, as mighty as he was in the scripture, he was still open to instruction. He was open to be taught. And when he understood that in Aquila and Priscilla had a more complete understanding, a more complete revelation of the things of God than what he had, what he did, he submitted himself to their teaching, and then he was able to take what they knew and to what he knew, and then he really was something then. Are you following me? There's no easy way to get to spiritual maturity. There's no easy way to be equipped in the word of God. And so I want to challenge all of you guys to make a, a greater commitment than what you currently have to your own spiritual growth and your own spiritual development by doing about five things. And by the end of the sermon, I'm going to have five of them. I just thought about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, as God gives them to me, I'm going to give them to you. <laughs> First of all, I want you to read the Bible every day. It was a surprise to me when somebody told me that they were talking to somebody from this church and they didn't realize they should read the Bible every day. So I want to encourage you to read the Bible every single day. Have a regimen, a systematic regimen of reading the Bible. And I would encourage you to read in advance what I'm going to preach about the next Sunday. And that will help you be prepared for what I'm going to preach about. Thirdly, I would encourage you to set your clock for 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. Because don't nobody need to be in the bed after 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. There ought to be, if there isn't a law, I think I'm going to introduce a law. You can't sleep behind 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. You can get up at 9 o'clock and you can make it to the church on Sunday morning. You can enjoy a continental breakfast. And you can be prepared to go to a class and be in discipleship class. Let me tell you why this is important. Because we got to find each other. We still don't know each other. We're just strangers passing by in the church. And we got to find each other so that God the Holy Spirit can knit people together in relationships that you have, you'll find people of a kindred spirit. And then fourthly, I'm going to encourage you, starting this Sunday, just give me one Sunday out of one, one Wednesday out of a month, just one. Let's start off with one Wednesday out of a month. I want to see all of y'all here on Wednesday night for our time of prayer meeting together and praise together. Just give me one Sunday out of a month so we can get together and spend some time together in prayer so we can share prayer requests with each other and so that we can see God moving and answer to prayer. Amen? Amen. Now before I finish this sermon, I'm going to come with a fifth one. (laughs) Well, they were at Ephesus, and so God was knitting them together. And so what God is doing, God is now raising up the caliber of support that the Apostle Paul needs to advance this ministry in Ephesus. And so he sends Apollos. Apollos received further instruction from Aquila and Priscilla. And now watch what God did. This is another little nuance. Now you got this powerhouse Apollos who's been in Ephesus and he's helped to build on what Paul is doing at Ephesus. And then Apollos said, now that I am better equipped, 
in the word of God, I want to go back near my own home. So when he says he wants to go back to Achaia, the Achaian province was near Macedonia, where he was from. And so that's where Corinth is. And that's where Athens is. And so now Apollos is getting ready to go back to Corinth, and that's where Paul had just came from. Corinth, another large, urban, metropolitan, seaport city with all the travelers, with the hustle and bustle, and Paul's strategy was, if I can win people in these cities, if I can win convert disciples in these cities and get people excited about the word of God in these cities and sharing the word of God in these cities, then they're going to encounter people that are traveling through these cities, and they themselves are going to be traveling to other places. And as they go, they will take the word of God. That was Paul's strategy. So now Apollos feels led to go back to Achaia, which is near Macedonia, which is where, near where Corinth and where Greece is. And so they encourage him to do so, verses 27 and 28. So the brethren gave him letters, and they exhorted the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly re helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews, publicly showing from the scripture that Jesus is the Christ. Now here's the nuance again. God now sends Apollos back to Corinth to build on what Paul had done there almost two years earlier. So now when you come to the book of 1 Corinthians, now you understand why Paul chastises the Corinthian church when they say, well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas. Because they were falling into this personality thing rather than focusing on the teaching of what was being taught. Paul had been there to take the word of God. Apollos had came and built on what Paul had taught. Peter had came in later time and built on what he had taught. That's how God stitches things together. And God connects people together through relationships. He connects people together through relationships. And as we allow God to connect us together through relationships, God can advance his work in and through the relationships and the network that he's building. Will somebody say amen? I'm going to have a stroke. Y'all won't help me. So Paul arrives at Ephesus. Paul leaves. Apollos comes to Ephesus. He builds on what Paul has taught. Apollos then goes to Corinth, and he goes to Corinth there, and he's building on what Paul had started there. Now look at verse 19. And it happened. You see, this is why I'm an expositor or a preacher. You can't get the nuances unless you go line by line and verse by verse. You read right over the nuance and you miss the point. And it happened while Apollos was where? At Corinth. While Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came where? To Ephesus. <laughs> so now Paul is coming to where Apollos has left, and Apollos is going where Paul had been two years ago. And God is stitching their work and stitching their ministry together, and he's building the church at Corinth, and he's also building the church at Ephesus, so both of those churches can stand strong in those pagan, idolatrous cities where they're located. This excites a Bible teacher. It doesn't do much for a congregation. See? But when you find these nuances in the text, and you see God's sovereign, divine hand stitching things together, in a way that only God could stitch together, that a casual observer, you won't even notice what God is showing. He is showing how his work is connected and how we're interconnected with other people through the Holy Spirit and how in due time God will bring people together so they can be connected together and they can see the divine majestic hand of God. So now watch what happens and we'll wrap it up right here. So Paul comes to Ephesus, and guess what? Paul found some of the disciples that Apollos had taught before he met Aquila and Priscilla. So now God brings Paul to Ephesus to complete some work that Apollos had started, but he didn't have complete revelation when he first met these people. Now watch, I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. Paul comes to the upper regions, he came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. 
So they had heard a message. It's obvious the message they had heard was the message that Apollos had preached before he met Aquila and Priscilla because Apollos only talked about the baptism of John. And the baptism of John did not talk about the Holy Spirit. The baptism of John just was, you better repent because judgment is coming. So Apollos left them looking for judgment. So Paul says, well, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we don't know if there'll be a Holy Spirit. Paul now understands what has happened. He says, then, well, what, what baptism were you identified with? They said, under John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came up upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. What is this all about? Again, what... The Holy Spirit is leading Luke to show is how God is connecting all of this work together. So when Apollos comes to Ephesus and he preaches about the baptism of John, there are some people that heard Apollos and they believe. But because his information was accurate and it was incomplete, he then moves on before he gets the chance to go back and talk to these people. God then brings Paul to Ephesus to meet these very people that Apollos had preached to and now Paul is able to bring these, and they were Jews. He was able to bring them to a full understanding and revelation, to understand that John's baptism was a baptism and looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. And now Jesus had indeed come. And in his death, burial, and resurrection, and after his ascension, he now poured out the Holy Spirit. So God now brings these Old Testament Jewish believers into the church under the ministry of Apostle Paul, as he stitches together the church across the world. It's incredible what God is doing. It's incredible what he's doing. And when you see the nuances in the text, you begin to see how even the scripture is divinely inspired because these little slight nuances are things that we would ordinarily miss. We wouldn't even see things like that until we would slow down and look at it extremely closely. How God is connecting people who haven't even met each other together, Apollos and Paul, they've not even yet met personally, but God is using them independently, and because he's orchestrating their work, they independently are working, and God is choreographing and orchestrating the work to bring people to salvation and to build and to strengthen the church. Are you following me? Uh, what, what am I saying? Here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is don't underestimate the power of God working in and through the local New Testament church. People take membership seriously. They take their large membership seriously. They take their fraternity membership seriously. They take their sorority membership seriously. They take all of these things seriously, but they don't take the church membership seriously. And they don't take seriously the fact that God, the Holy Spirit, brings me to a local church. God places me there, and God is trying to connect me through relationships with other people at that place because God is going to do something only he can do and he's going to do it in and through us as he stitch and knit us together into a body. There might be times that God is using me to encourage this person over here and I don't even know that God has already had someone coming behind me to bring the encouragement that I can't bring. God might be speaking one word to a person that they need, but I don't have the complete understanding or the divine revelation that they need, but God brings someone else and they build on that. That's why Paul said, one plants the seed, one waters. God brings forth the increase, but God's work is done in and through the context of the local church. That's the way God has chosen to work in and through this generation. That's why, my beloved, yeah, y'all ought to clap. Y'all ought to clap. Y'all ought to clap. You know, I'm not looking for nothing else to do and nothing else to be a part of because there's nothing on the earth that is more grand, glorious, and magnificent than the local New Testament church. It's upon the rock of Christ that God promised to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And if we together collectively would take our church membership 
and our church responsibility more seriously, we'll be amazed at what God would indeed do in and through us. And he gives us just a glimpse of it right here in this text. Well, let me move on before I bore you. So these people, now they receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. Verse 8, he says, and he went into the synagogue, men, Paul, and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now, let me tell you what we're trying to do here at the Grace Bible Church. We have got to reason with people these days. People are listening to a whole lot of stuff. A lot of different things are being said. People do not automatically accept the Bible as the authoritative word of God. And don't think that they do because that many of them don't. They've been educated into ignorance. And that happened with a high criticism a couple hundred years ago when they decided to elevate themselves above the authority of the Bible. Christian people today, we must be equipped with the word of God and we've got to be able to reason with people. We've got to be able to come into their world with the word of God and the principles of God's word and show them the reasonableness of the scripture. To show them how what God has to say is reasonable. How, how what God has to say is logical. And that Paul understood that. He understood that people weren't going to believe in Jesus just because he stood up and said it. Particularly a Jewish audience. He understood that he had to understand the Old Testament and he had to logic, logically and with reason take them through the scripture to bring them to the conclusion who Jesus was. And so is the case today. So Paul is reasoning with them. But their opposition was so strong against him. Verse 9, and they were so hardened against him, and they started to speak so much evil against the way that he was teaching, that he realized that they were hurting. This was too difficult for the disciples to endure, so he took them out of that hostile environment, and he took them to the school of Tyrannus, so he could continue to build those people that were receiving the Scripture. And he did this for two years. These are nuances you miss in the Bible. That every day for two years, Paul gave himself to teaching, to instruction, to discipleship, to building up a group of people because he knew that he would not be there with them forever. But when he left, he wanted them to be able to withstand the onslaught of evil and not be destroyed or discouraged. So he builds them up in the word of God. There's no replacement. I wish that I could tell you there is an easy way to develop spiritual stamina, to develop the spiritual muscle and the tenacity that you need, to develop a holy resiliency that we need to stand these evil days. There is no easy way to do it apart from the spiritual discipline of prayer and Bible study and discussion and conversation. And that's why the Holy Spirit equips us in the things of God. Amen. Give me seven minutes, and I'll be through, I promise. So then, verse 11, the final thing I want you to see. In verse 11 of 19, it says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, the New King James says, because what he's wanting to show here, that this was not the norm of what God did. In many cases, Paul just had to grind it out. But because of the decadence and the darkness, the spiritual opposition that Paul encountered at Ephesus, then God supernaturally empowers the hands of the Apostle Paul to do some miraculous things to give veracity, credibility to Paul's words. So the miracles in the Bible are not for the sake of the miracle. The miracle in the Bible is always to support the authority of the words that's being spoken. It's always to direct people to the word that is being spoken that can bring salvation. Are you following me? So the power was so pronounced and pro so profound in the hands of the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to show you what these guys on TV get some of the stuff they're doing from. They're just taking it out of context. 
It was so powerful, Paul couldn't be everywhere. But God wanted anybody who had the faith to believe, to know that the power of God had come to Ephesus and that God has brought his power to Ephesus primarily through his authoritative preacher, the Apostle Paul. So what they did, they would bring handkerchiefs or aprons and they would bring them to Paul and he would touch them and they would take these handkerchiefs and aprons back to sick people and the sick people's diseases would be healed, their illnesses would be cured, and evil spirits would be exercised out of the persons. And what God was showing to Ephesus that my power has come to this city and my power is being unleashed in this city through this spokesperson who brings this message of the gospel of the grace of God that salvation can only be experienced by repentance toward God and faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What God was doing was giving authority to the words that Paul preached. And Paul had to have power behind his words because there was so much spiritual darkness, so much demonic oppression, and so much demonic force in Ephesus because the people had given themselves to witchcraft and to idolatry and to pagan worship. Are you following me? This is how God works, ladies and gentlemen. God takes the church into the toughest places, into the darkest places, places so that he can unleash his power in those places. And so it's God's design for the church. We come to the church house and we get in discipleship class and we get prayed for and we get encouraged and we get in equipped and we get our needs met so that we leave and we are dispersed back to our respective neighbors, communities, and jobs so that we can be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ to bear witness to the power of God through the way we live our lives in a hostile environment. Well, so the power of God is being unleashed through the hands of the Apostle Paul, the power to heal the sick, the power to heal the disease, the power over the demonically oppressed. And any time you show some power, then you're going to attract some attention. And so Paul's work attracts attention. And these were the, these Jews. They wanted the power that Paul had. They didn't just want the Christ that he was offering to them. And so here's what they do. Verse 13, I read this again. You, you're hearing it will be through. Then some of the itinerant Jews exercise some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, verse 13, took upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And they said, we adjure you, we command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> we go by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And seven of these boys were the sons of a Jewish high priest, a man by the name of Sceva. And the evil spirit say, no, wait a minute. We know Jesus, and we know, and we know Paul, but who in the world are y'all? <laughs> who are you guys? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. See, what this passage teaches us is that a secondhand knowledge of Christ is not enough to give you power. It's not enough to give you power. Just because you know somebody that know Jesus, and you've been around somebody that know Jesus, and your grandmama know Jesus, and your great-grandmama knew Jesus, and somebody in your family knew Jesus, that don't give you the power to call on his name. Oh, I wish I had some help up in here. To use his name, to use his name, you got to know him personally for yourself. You got to have a personal first-hand encounter with him. Can I get a witness? Now, I love young people, and I do all I can to help young people in this city. And any of I can, I can help, you see. But there are five plus four, a total of nine, they got my last name. And so those nine who have my last name, they have access to everything that I got on request. Now, somebody else can say, I know your dad, and I know you. But knowing them, don't make them know me. 
And without my last name, they don't have access to what the Lord has allowed to come to my hand. I wish y'all could help me. But when you know the daddy, when you know his name, he know your name, you got his last name, then everything he have access to, you have access to. Oh, I wish I could get a witness up in here. I got a big cell phone bill one time. Because one of my kids went down to the town center mall. They couldn't get the phone, but they said my daddy's name is. So they gave them the phone because of their daddy's name. Now, I argued with the people for a while, but after a while I figured out, well, I've given my children permission to use my name. So even though I had not given it to them specifically, I'm still obligated because of the name. The name of Jesus dispenses power. The name of Jesus gives you authority. The name of Jesus gives you benefits. The name of Jesus gives you access to everything that heaven has, but you got to know him for yourself. You young people, you got to know Jesus. You got to know him for yourself. Because when you come to know him, when you come to know him, demons will shudder at that name. The devil himself shakes in his spiritual boots when he hears the name of Jesus because of the power and the authority in that name. So the Bible says, with all of Diana worship, with all of the pagan idolatry, with all of the deviant lifestyle that was taking place in Ephesus, when Paul showed up with that name, demons were being exercised, people were being healed, Lives were being changed, and the Bible says, and the word of God grew mightily, and the name of Jesus was lifted up. I just stopped by to tell you today, there's still power in that name, and he still unleashes the power of his name in the midst of a few ragtag disciples who come together in the name of Jesus. Just two or three come together, but if you get two or three hundred coming together, look how much power has been multiplied. So I just stopped by the table this morning. Don't be discouraged and don't be dismayed. If you know the name of Jesus, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you've called on that name, then the power that you need to continue to live in this life and to face all of the giants you have to encounter, that power God will indeed disseminate to you this morning. Oh, I wish I had a witness. I wish I had a witness. I'm not through. I'm just going to quit. And if you want to hear the rest of it, you can follow me to 549 Morning Dove Lane, and we can have some real church up in that house. Oh, I wish I had a witness here this morning. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, how sweet the name, how rich the name, how glorious the name, how magnificent the name, for the salvation in no other name under heaven given among men. What about we must be saved? Somebody ought to bless his name. 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 The psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And forget not his many benefits. Oh, bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. The doors of the church is open. Demitation is extended. Somebody here this morning, your mama know Jesus. Your husband, your wife might know him but you don't know him for yourself. You can come to know him today. As the lover of your soul, you can come to know him today as the one who will pardon and forgive your sins. It doesn't matter how far you have fallen. God loves you. He loves you. He has placed a price upon your soul. And that was his own holy, righteous, precious blood. And he's already shed his blood to pay the full price for all of your sins. The ones in the past, the ones you currently engaged in, and he's already paid in advance for the ones that you're going to commit that you don't even know about. And that's how much he loves you. And he offers you salvation. Let us all bow together, shall we? Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's someone here today, if there's someone here today, who realize they need to know the Lord and they just want to be saved. Just want to be saved. Raise your hand right where you are if you want to be saved. God bless you, young lady. I see your hand. 
If you really mean it, if you really mean it, God wants to save you. Young people need to be saved also. You want to be saved. You want to experience God's forgiveness. Is there one here today? Just raise your hand and, and, and just say to the Lord, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I've sinned. I've fallen short. I've missed the mark. But I believe that you love me. That you died on the cross for me. You shed your blood for me. And that you were buried and raised from the dead for me. And I put my trust, my hope in you, Lord Jesus. Did someone pray, pray that prayer. If you pray that prayer from your heart and really mean it, if so just raise your hand. Let someone come and pray with you, encourage you in the name of the Lord. Is there one? Is there one? Maybe you already are saved, but you sense a need to recommit your life to Christ, surrender your life to the Lord and really live for him. Now is the time. Today is the day. There's no better time than now. God will accept you right where you are today. He will start to rebuild your life today. Is there one? God bless you, young lady. I see that hand. Maybe you're looking for a church home. We'd love to have you here at the Grace Bible Church. It'd be our great joy to have you to come to join with us and unite with us. To be a part of this little band of believers here who's trying to gather together to do the Lord's work. Is there one? If not, let us prepare at this time for the Lord's table. This being the first Sunday of the month here at the Grace Bible Church, we observe the communion. And the communion 